The International Association for Near-Death Studies presents NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio, brought to you by IANS, the International Association for Near-Death Studies. I'm your host, Lee Whitting. Today's guest, Father Nassel, is a Catholic priest and one of three panelists in the chaplain's discussion I'll be moderating at the IONS Conference in Bellevue, Washington, this coming weekend. Father Castle is the author of the soon-to-be-published book, The Interrupted Death Experience. The book describes how, for over 20 years, he has been visited in dreams by persons who died suddenly or traumatically and have not been able to complete their transition to the afterlife. Instead of joining loved ones, moving along a path through a tunnel or toward a light, these persons find themselves shut down and isolated. These interrupted death experiences are later processed in prayer with Father Nathan and a partner. Together they help these persons complete their transition. Their dramatic stories are presented in their own unique voices in Father Nathan's forthcoming book. Father Nathan is also the author of And Toto Too, The Wizard of Oz as a Spiritual Adventure. In the Amazon description of that book, they say, The author is a Catholic priest who bravely shares his belief that God loves everybody wildly, extravagantly, beyond belief, and beyond belief systems. Nathan, welcome to NDE Radio. It's good to be here, Lee. Well, it's it's good to have you, and I'm looking forward to our conversation as well as Thank to you. our uh, before we before we even get into it, uh, could I uh, the uh, the the book title wasn't exactly right. Could I, could we uh, clarify that? Of course. Um, it's the name of the book is Afterlife Interrupted, helping stuck souls cross over, and then the reading line is a Catholic priest explores the interrupted death experience. All right. Was okay. that a last last minute change or? <laughs> <laughs> we named the baby about 10 days ago. <laughs> okay. Very good. Well, um, Nathan, uh, to go back to the quote about, uh, from, from Amazon, why do you suppose a God who loves us wildly and extravagantly would leave souls stuck on a plane and in need of your help? I don't believe that, uh, well, this involves some sort of movement. That's some sort of crossing over, however you understand the journey from this body and this life and time to the afterlife, there's some sort of movement involved. And I just think God respects free will and doesn't drag anybody where they don't want to go. Mm-hmm. And the but, people that I have worked with have their reasons for uh, delaying, or as I call it, interrupting that process right at the moment of their traumatic, violent death. And uh, they just kind of need to get their breath sometimes or, Maybe you could call it resting in peace for a time before they uh, go on a journey. Okay. Well, how about take take us back to how this first started and and how these souls are communicating with you in dreams. Well, in the book, I go back to childhood to kind of try to give the reader some uh, exposure to the way I was brought up spiritually and some spiritual experiences that were childhood ones. But your question is more to the point of when did this business start of having people come in a dream? And that was in about the year 2000. So coming up, you know, 18, 20 years ago, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, the experience was simply I was asleep. I, I, I've, I've long had the, pro, the, uh, the, the practice of blessing my sleep before I enter it. I'm, I belong to a semi-monastic religious order a semi-contemplative order, the Dominicans. And we consecrate our sleep before, uh, as our last prayer of the night, and kind of hand our consciousness to God and essentially say, would you would you hang on to this <laughs> while I'm unconscious? And, oh, by the way, if there's anything that you can accomplish in me while I'm unconscious, uh, feel free to. So mm-hmm. that's been my practice for my whole adult life. And then um, what started happening is... Uh, I had a dream that that moved from my material into something quite wild, a man on fire on the hood of a car. And it had nothing to do with me or anything that preceded it. And I woke up from it with a start, uh, and I knew right away that there was something. Uh, I 
called it a disturbance in the force. <laughs> there was something spiritual going on, and somebody mm-hmm. was in trouble. So I went into prayer right away and, and just said in prayer to the guy, whoever you are, I, I got the message, and I'll see what I can do to help. So that's how it started. Hmm. How, how do you suppose he knew to contact you? It was one of the first questions I asked when I had the opportunity. <laughs> and uh, yeah, what he and others after him said is essentially, I don't know, somebody brought me here. Ah. Okay. A uh, guardian angel, perhaps. That's exactly it. Um, they don't yeah. always know that that's... The, they, even when they try to be absolutely isolated, everybody out of here, leave me alone, their guardians don't go off duty. Their guardians, whatever kind of afterlife geography, uh, topography, whatever space they end up in, their guardian will go to the edge of it and try to give them as much of the privacy that they want as as they can, but they won't go off duty. They won't leave their post. Now, not all of these people are Catholic, I would guess. Oh, certainly not, and uh, nor necessarily Christian or churchgoers, or uh, mosque attendees, or anything. Uh, no, they are, you know, you know <laughs> lots of people will die today, and they're not all going to be one kind. Oh, of course, but but uh, then how do you direct your prayers to uh, to a Christian God? Well, I believe in one God. The uh, That's the first line of, the, of both the Apostles and Nicene Creed, and yes. I believe there's only one, and in the... Uh, the, the word Catholic. I'm a Catholic priest. It it can be used two ways in English. If you if you have a capital C at the beginning, it refers to the denomination that's you know a, a slice of the world population. And then if you spell it with a small c, it just means universal. Uh, and so I believe I'm a priest of the universe. Well, I belong to both. I belong to the denomination and I belong to the universe. So all these folk, if they came to me, I'll help however I can. That's a terrific way of understanding it. I, I, I really, I love that. Um, tell us, um, now, when you said this, this man who was caught in a fire, was this going on at the time that you got the communication or had it happened in the past? No, no, it had happened almost 40 years earlier. Ah, um, so he'd so been I stuck mean, all that time. He had, although, um, it, it, it Many of these people don't have an experience of time once they've left it, but I discovered others do. There seems to be some um, variety there. They they might not be in the flow of time exactly the way they were before, but they can pay attention to it if they want to. Some of them don't really want to. But um, this guy was named Ray, and he uh, died in Georgia in 1960. He was only 20, and he was – he. Um, he got gotten his girlfriend pregnant their senior year of high school. They married, and the baby was about a year and a half old when uh, his accident happened. And he died really angry, screaming, and he had been taught, I learned, that the reason people die is because God takes them. You ever heard that before? Oh, yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> well then what happens if you're 20 and you die in a fire and you just want to curse God? He pretty much he said to me, "Who the hell does he think he is taking me just when my <laughs> life was getting good?" Uh, <laughs> and so he wanted no part of the kingdom of God, uh, the God who just burned him up in a fire. Who would? Mm. Um, of course, in near death experiences, the majority of them are very positive experiences, and without their even uh, agreeing to it, they seem to be whisked into a, a place of light and love. So. Something yeah, held him. Gonna, something held him back. Well, part, that was it in part. Uh, the this idea of, of God taking people and not wanting to go with anybody. He also died traumatically, and that's the thing that all the people that I've dealt with in this realm, none of them died peacefully in their sleep. Uh, they all die violent, sudden, uh, tragic deaths, where their consciousness goes from from going along like you and I are to suddenly being dead. And sometimes as a victim of a violent crime, other times accidents and horrible things, whatever it is. And mm-hmm. sometimes the, uh, the experience is too, too jolting to, um, to go with the program or follow others' advice or whatever. They, they just uh, they interrupt the death process. Do you encounter many suicides? Once in a while. 
Although it's funny when I don't suppose funny is the right word to use when talking about suicide, but but it's it, they I I hardly ever in the pictures that they show me these dreams feel like little uh, videos, mm-hmm. like much of our dreams, little moving pictures in our head in the night. Uh, when they are suicides, there's it's the depiction of it is seldom blatant. I don't see somebody taking a gun and shooting themselves or. Or hanging themselves or whatever it's it's more subtle than that but you begin to get the picture that oh i think this one might have taken their own life mm. so they are in in a way hiding the fact from you or ashamed of the fact that they did it to themselves their shame enters into a lot of these stories and uh maybe maybe it's a you know they don't know me we're strangers at the outset so maybe that's not the first thing you lead with, the fact that you yes. killed yourself. Uh, but because you're, I feel like mine is a healing work, and at some point you have to disclose to the doctor what the real symptoms are, <laughs> what the real problem is. You might, you might have ever had to go to the doctor with something that was embarrassing to you that you really rather would not talk about. <laughs> except that you're not going to heal if, if you don't say right and then just hint at it and let him yeah. try to figure out yeah. what you're talking about yeah precisely but but that does happen and yeah. people one of the sweet things i've learned about the afterlife is that the bits of it that i've seen are that there's lots lots of patience uh and people aren't being rushed or stressed that they're not keeping up with the group or something like that that it's uh, it unfolds gracefully as people uh, at the pace they can take. Mm. The traditional Catholic belief about suicide is that it's an unforgivable sin. What, well, what, what's your thinking on no that? True. Well, I'm 52 years old, and when I was a child, that was true. Um, uh, but that changed. It changed canonically in 1991, but it, it, it changed organically, you know, all through the 70s and 80s. Um, and by the time we got, there was a new rite of, of uh, funerals put out in 91 that made it possible to, uh, that made it official. What everyone was doing already was to uh, have a funeral mass for a suicide victim and bury them in a Catholic cemetery and all that. It used to be thought that, that they'd committed a mortal sin, but that, that uh, involves mental clarity. Mm-hmm. And the presumption began to shift from, the, the presumption that a person knew what they were doing and did it on purpose to they must have been under such duress that they weren't thinking clearly. That that began to be the shift. There, I've read articles about people who've jumped off the um, Golden Gate Bridge and, and a few of them have survived. And they say when they're as they're falling, they realize that they have just made a terrible mistake almost yeah. universally. So that's a... Uh, that's a repentance right then and there. Tell tell me how do you feel this uh, these souls relate to the notion of ghosts? Well, it depends on what one thinks of as a ghost. Sometimes I think the popular notion of a ghost is uh, a, a deceased human being who has who stays in in one place, like uh, room thirteen in the haunted hotel, mm. or Maybe uh, uh, beside the road where the car crash happened, or something like that. Um, I have encountered a few people that have done that, that that did stay right where they died, and uh, and didn't create some other afterlife space. But those have been few. Um, uh, there, all of them are, are are spiritual beings that are not currently in the body that they inhabited that died and have not moved on, but they're not all located in some earth space. Mm. Uh, there's uh, There are some theories that ghosts are souls who are addicted to a, a person or a place or a time, and um, so they might not uh, necessarily want to leave. They might not necessarily come to you for help. Or if not, addicted at least attached to uh, mm-hmm. uh for example the very first one the man i mentioned his name is ray the issue that he brought uh which ended up being unusual after i've had about 250 of these but wow. he, he his um his issue was he he stayed 
behind and paid attention to his wife and son, and who her wife was now in her 60s and was dying of cancer. And he wanted to be with her when she passed. But he said, I can't the way I am. Well, then we have to figure out how you are and what it would take to get you to be a, a greeter when she passes. So that became our common work in the first one. Wow. So they show you a video of, of the story. That's that what they, it looks like. That yeah. put them where they, where they are. Then how do you dialogue with them after that? I get, uh, first of all, I learned to uh, keep a journal in the night pan so that when these things happen, I can, uh, I'm pretty light sleeper anyway. And so I, when I wake up from one of them, I immediately say a prayer and write down what I recall as quick as I can. I pray, don't, don't leave just yet. <laughs> let, me, let me see if I got this right. Help me get these details down. And then when I'm able, I get with a prayer partner. And uh, we go into prayer. At the, the the very first ones, I had a prayer partner who I believe had a gift of prophecy that enabled her to uh, allow these souls to borrow her voice, her voice long enough to speak to me so that I could talk back and forth. Mm. Um, and then over time, I I learned that I had that gift as well. And so I just need to be with a partner. Uh, someone who can listen if I bring the person through with my borrowing my voice, or uh, if I'm with someone who also has that gift, well, then I might be able to kind of sit back and listen. Do you feel you have a gift as a medium along with the dreams, or are you just a I call it per- participant? In, 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 my, uh, in my Catholic church world, uh, medium is a, a flash word. It's a, a word that and in my little corner of the world, not the little corner of the world, uh, evokes the occult and the demonic and so on. So there's, uh, I, it's, it, there's, it, it's not helpful to me to to apply that word to myself. I believe and yet, it's a prophecy. And yet, as a small C Catholic priest, you are uh, open to probably more than you learned in seminary. Oh, great deal. Yeah, but I'm. You know, I'm uh, as an author and as a narrator of my own story, I get to choose my word. <laughs> so I'm choosing the word <laughs> prophecy. Yes. Um, so then, when you find someone who has these abilities as a medium to communicate back and forth, you don't feel like you're violating any of your uh, of your training. Well, I'm going to push back against you, Lee. I'm I'm, I'm not. With a medium, I'm with another person who has a gift of prophecy. However, <laughs> okay, uh, am, I, am, am I violating anything? I have the uh, my my immediate superior, my uh, my prior provincial of my Dominican province has read the book and has uh, concurred that my that I'm using a spiritual gift. And uh, surely others will disagree. That's just that's just the way the world is, isn't it? I mean, not everybody agrees with you on what, much of anything you say. That's uh, absolutely so, true. So, but, well, you know, I'm, I know I'll face that. Mm. But I think um, it's important. These people are stuck. And uh, I use the example uh, in the book of uh, the, the Good Samaritan story. Yes. You recall the Good Samaritan story? There's somebody absolutely. that's bleeding in the ditch and, and, you know, in danger of death. And, uh, you know, in the pattern of so many stories, there's, it's a, you know, it's a triad that, one guy goes by, but he's a priest on his way to the temple, and he doesn't dare get his self sullied with blood and gore. So he keeps walking, goes to his religious duties. The second guy is pretty much the same thing. And then the third one, who's from this outcast, uh, despised group, is the one that shows compassion, stops, and renders aid and all of that. Well, I just feel like, yes, it's true that I'm a priest, but I'm not going to be the kind of priest that walks by suffering and ignores it uh, uh, just so that I can keep my own... Uh, status unsullied. <laughs> Just not going to do that. <laughs> Isn't it strange in that story that the priest? I mean, I understand the, the all the purity um, rules and regulations and Judaism, but that he, that death should be so um, untouchable for them when, at the same time, in the temple, they're 
killing sacrifices at a, on a regular yeah, basis. Yeah, they were around blood all the time in the temple. Well, you know, Jesus doesn't come down real harshly. It's Jesus is telling the story. It's his story. And yes. he, he doesn't condemn the first two. He simply uh, tells the story and leaves the reader to draw their own conclusions. And the well, he does ask which, which one is the neighbor, which one is the is the you know the one with the heart to do God's work. Of course, he wouldn't be telling the story if it weren't for the moral. He <laughs> wants people to, <laughs> to treat each other that way. Um, but he didn't he didn't lambast the first two for being uh, uh, horrible people. Uh, I think his hearers would have understood that the rules are rules, and and sometimes people follow the rules rather than doing the the greater good. Yes. Have you ever encountered um, someone who's asked you to pass on a message to a to a loved one who's still alive? Um, you know, I I have not so much in this. Um, I don't have any story like that. In this book, I did, I did go back and ask. I have 13 stories that I'm telling in the book, and I did feel that it was important to go back and ask people's permission to use their stories, mm. because the stories are so personal, and some yes. of them involve um, embarrassing detail, which is the reason some people isolate to begin with. They died in some uh, scandalous, embarrassing context that uh, blew their story and made made them. Uh, I don't know, embarrassed about their own funeral. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I think I'll t- ask you a question again. I think I've lost the, my train of thought there. Oh, um, if you if if you had ever been asked by one of these souls, please tell my wife, for example, uh, that I love her, or uh, communicate some detail uh, that that they feel that it's necessary to to let someone know about. No, it's funny. Uh, it's a good question, but but the simple answer is no. Their their uh, their the concern they bring to me is more narrow. It's about um, I understand that it's time for me to try to move along, and how can you help me do that? It's more. It's mm-hmm. these these conversations are pretty brief, given the gravity of what we're dealing with. You know, moving yes. from stuck to unstuck, but they never take more than maybe forty minutes tops, thirty minutes. And some of that is just getting uh, establishing some rapport at the front end because we're strangers to each other. Yes. Uh, but but no, not really. Um, okay. How did how is this um, these communications changed your view of um, purgatory, and how do you understand the na- the nature of purgatory? Well, the Catholic belief uh, the the word purgatory has the root purge underneath it, which just means to, to thoroughly cleanse. And so purgatory, if you simply go with what the word means, is, is some sort of afterlife space, realm, uh, dimension, where the main work is to be cleansed. And uh, the, the and, and of course, that's a Catholic word that a lot of people don't use. But it, it just makes sense to me that there would be a continuum and that oftentimes death does come without any warning and people's life is uh, interrupted um, and and it's an unfinished business. So, um, the, But the, the biggest thing, Lee, has been, especially in, in all these little conversations that were follow-up, when I started asking people permission to use their story, I thought I was going to get simple yes or no answers. And... Uh, without fail, they instead became these updates, really sweet updates. And some of these people had, um, you know, I dealt with 12, 15 years ago. And so they've had whatever time is like after one passes and crosses um, to give me, to have other experiences to tell me about. And mm. the over the overriding one is that they they so enjoy being in a place where they're not judged. Nobody's judging them. Nobody's criticizing them. Nobody's having unkind thoughts or unkind words. Uh, they just get to live in peace with nobody judging them. And so that's Are they... me. I'm, uh, 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 what you're, it's eleven o'clock or after eleven where you are, isn't it? Yes, it's uh, about uh, twenty-five after. 
Well, let me ask you this. Have you, have you had a judgmental thought or your action or words yet today? Um, uh, probably. I, <laughs> we, we <laughs> make judgments all the time. You know, that's what I mean. And some of them are unkind, even if you don't speak them. You know, you oh, just see sure. somebody walking by and don't like their, their looks, uh, or whatever. Uh, it's, I, it's I judge my do- I judge my dog when it got me up at four thirty in the morning to go out. <laughs> yeah, damn dog. Yeah, that, well, I, I just, it, one of the things that it's done for me, Lee, is is try to uh, it's made me stop and think more about unnecessary opinions, judgments, whether I speak them or whether they're just in my head or whatever. Uh, I want to live. I want to. Uh, I want to honor the experience that I've had and be a person that contributes to. Uh, I don't know, the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. <laughs> I, would, I would like earth to be a non-judgment zone. Oh, absolutely. But it's it's not, it's not just the reverse, unfortunately. T- uh, tell yeah. me, now, some of these um, um, reports uh, that you've gotten later, after they've crossed over, do they reflect uh-huh. the uh, the same nature of, um, I'll call it heaven, as as do uh, near-death experiences that you've read about? I'm not sure. You know, and this will be my first um, near-death conference. I've gone to a lot of afterlife conferences, but and near-death comes up. But this, mm-hmm. I have a lot to learn about near-death. I've just, you know, I've read Raymond Moody in the 70s, and I've kind of had an active interest. But I'll be, I'll be learning a lot when I'm around all these people. Um, but the, the, the heaven, the afterlife part of it, all of the people that I've dealt with are newbies. They even reference the fact that um, they know that they're brand new at this and they don't want to go too far beyond the facts. <laughs> they, they, they're kind of, they, sometimes they make an analogy about being a newborn. And if you asked a baby about what life on Earth is like, what would they tell you? you know, they, they'd be able to tell you about a few things that they've picked up so far, but there's still an awful lot more to experience. That's That's yes. been... Uh, a lot of people have met up with relatives, including relatives that they that died before they were even born. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so some have enjoyed knowing that they belong to a line of people that were happy to see them. There's pl- a lot of reunions. Um, so a lot of people doing a thing that they wish they could have done. Uh, a, a woman who was paraplegic who now just says, I'm like a little girl doing uh, handstands on the lawn. Oh, well, that's she wonderful. can move. And all she wants to do is move. And she said, I know I'll get tired of this uh, eventually, but for right now, all I want to do is move. So in, it does sound like they have a, a, an Earth-similar environment, you know, uh, that um, gets reported frequently. Yeah, uh, I'm, from I, I, believe, I don't know. I believe I'm, I've just looked through a peephole. I'm not giving any guided tours of the afterlife, um, mm. but I can at least report what I have seen or what's what's been relayed to me and the people that I've dealt with largely are, are doing something that was related to what they were doing before only doing, especially education. Lots of people are, there's some sort of schools that they go to, to learn the things they want to learn. And they mm-hmm. find that there are other people that want to learn what they also want to learn. One, for example, is how to be involved in the lives of your kids. If you die with young children, uh, that you didn't get to raise. Wow. Uh, that one, it seems like there's a kind of little academies where people can go and learn how to not be a creepy, haunting ghost, but how you mm-hmm. can, can somehow stay actively engaged in the lives of your family to to an appropriate degree. Very nice. Oh, Nathan, unfortunately, we are just about out of time. Uh, tell the audience how they might find your books and your website. Well, the, the book uh, is not out yet, but I'm, we have a, a round an October 1st release date. It'll be first on Amazon, and then it'll be, you know, wherever books are sold. Afterlife Interrupted, Helping Stuck Souls Crossover, A Catholic Priest Explores the Interrupted Death Experience. Right now, my website is my name, Nathan, N-A-T-H-A-N, dash castle, C-A-S-T-L-E, dot com, Nathan, dash castle, dot com. Wow. Nathan, thank you so much. This has been a fascinating show, and I look forward well, to, be fun to be getting together with you, with you out in there in um, in Cal- 
gosh, where are we going? Seattle, yeah, Washington. We're going to, I'm going to Washington. Is that where I'm in? <laughs> yes. You're in California. I'm in Maine, and uh, my geography is all scrambled at, at yeah, the present right. moment. And the three of the four but, corners. But, yeah, I'll but see I'll you, see uh, you later, in, later this week in okay, Bellevue, definitely. Washington. Uh-huh. Okay. All right. Thanks. See you then. If listeners would like to hear this show again or any of our past shows, just go to our website at nderadio.org and hit the past shows button. And for more information about IANS, including the upcoming annual conference, uh, and and if you can't make the conference, um, you'll find information there about getting tapes and recordings of the various meetings. So go to the IANS website at iands.org, and please join us again next Monday. 11 a.m. Eastern for more NDE Radio. This is Lee Whitting saying thanks for listening.